spiritually minded is the subject matter of our lesson this morning, being spiritually minded. We want to begin as we think about the idea of being spiritually minded by backing up just a little bit to think about our own spiritual condition. What we find, of course, is that all responsible individuals fall under condemnation at some point. And we find that the Bible places all capable people, all mentally capable people under condemnation because of sin. And that is due to our own failures. In Romans 3 and verse 23, the Bible tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So every person who is capable of sinning, at some point in his or her life, does something that is wrong, that transgresses the will of God. The wages of sin is death, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6 and verse 23. Every responsible individual in this world at some point breaks God's law, commits sin. And as a result of those sins we have personally committed, we fall under condemnation. We become guilty sinners. Now, with that in mind, the good news is that some condemned individuals will be saved. In spite of the fact that we've all sinned and that we've all placed ourselves under condemnation, the Bible tells us that some sinners will not remain in that state of condemnation. And that takes us to Romans chapter 8. The first couple of verses of that chapter, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. That's what I have on the screen. The Apostle Paul says, There is therefore now, notice this, <clears throat> no condemnation. <coughs> Excuse me. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so here we have the situation of being condemned because of our sins, but we can go from being condemned in our sins to where there is no condemnation. The good news for us is that because God sent His own Son, as we've just spent time remembering as we've partaken of the Lord's Supper, the good news is that because God sent His Son to live a sinless life, to die as the perfect sinless sacrifice, that that sacrifice can take away our sins. We can be acquitted of our guilt. We can be forgiven of our sins through Him. There in Romans chapter 8, in the next couple of verses, in verses 3 and 4, Paul goes on to say, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The simple fact of the matter is that had the blood of the Son of God not been shed on the cross, had He not died for us, not only would we stand condemned as sinners, but there would also be no way out of that condemnation. We would be doomed to destruction. But since He did die for us, those who are in Christ Jesus are no longer condemned. Here we've all sinned, we've all become condemned, but when a condemned sinner hears the gospel of Christ, believes the gospel, repents of sin, and is baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, that person becomes freed from all past sin. is no longer condemned. We back up in Romans to chapter 6 and verses 17 and 18. Paul wrote to those who had already obeyed the gospel in Rome. And notice what he says there in Romans 6 verses 17 and 18. But God be think that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We can go from being slaves of sin to being set free from sin and being slaves of righteousness instead. 
So not all condemned individuals remain condemned. We can be freed from condemnation. At the same time, not all condemned individuals will be saved. But those who obey the gospel, those who enter into Christ, have been freed from the condemnation of sin. Now with that in mind, we need to understand this. It is the spiritually minded Christian who will go to heaven. While it's true that we can be freed from the condemnation of sin through Christ, as we've just read in these passages, it is also true that some who obey the gospel will not be saved in the end. Just as it is true that only some condemned individuals will be forgiven, it's also the case that only some Christians will end up going to heaven. The Bible teaches that an eternal home in heaven is reserved for those Christians who are spiritually minded. Spiritually minded. Those are the ones who are going to live with God for eternity. So, as we think about that, the next question that comes to mind is, how can we be spiritually minded? That is what we need to be if we're going to have eternal life with God when this earthly life comes to an end. If the spiritually minded Christians are the only ones who are really going to heaven, then we need to make sure that we are spiritually minded Christians. So we want to notice in Romans chapter 8, as we continue in the passage that we started reading a moment ago, how we can make sure that we are spiritually minded. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 5 as we pick up there. Paul says, For those, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Notice that there in verse 6. There's our terminology. Spiritually minded. That's what we need to be. Continuing on in verse 7, he says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. I want us to think this morning for the next few minutes about the idea of being spiritually minded and specifically answering that question as to how how we can be spiritually minded. It is so important that we recognize that we are not just to be Christians, but that we are to be spiritually minded in our approach to life as Christians. How can we do that? Well, in order to be spiritually minded, you first have to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. That's what we read and what Paul wrote there in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds in the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Here's the idea of setting your mind on something. The spiritually minded person is focused on the things of God. The minds of those who are spiritually minded, as Paul says here, their minds are set on the things of the Spirit. In other words, this is the kind of person who is focused on God. 
focused on the things of God every day throughout the week. Not just for a few hours on Sunday, and not even just maybe on Wednesday night, not just here and there, but this is the kind of person who is focused on the things of God every day throughout the week. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that that he spends 24 hours a day in Bible study or in prayer to God. We recognize that, that would be impossible for us to accomplish. So we're not saying that here this person is constantly praying, constantly reading the Bible, or, or constantly in study of God's Word every minute of every day. But what it does mean is that this is the kind of in individual who is aware of God, and who is thinking about God, thinking about the Word of God, thinking about his relationship with God on some level throughout the day that we are constantly aware of our relationship with God and how important that is to us. And we're constantly aware of what we need to do to please Him and how to avoid those things that would not please Him. That's the idea of minding the things of the Spirit. Focusing on the things of God. The spiritually minded person follows the instruction that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 6 in verse 33. Do you remember what Jesus said? In Matthew 6 and verse 33, as he talked about not worrying about the things of this life, material things, physical things, he said in the conclusion of all of that, in Matthew 6 and verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's the idea of setting your mind on the things of the Spirit. God is first. The things of God are the priority in my life, no matter what else is going on. Now, you may have noticed as we were reading in Romans chapter 8 that Paul makes a contrast here between those who have got the right focus and those who have the wrong focus. He talks about those who live according to the flesh, those who have their minds in the things of the flesh, those who are carnally minded, carnally minded. Be carnally minded is to be focused on the flesh, the earthly desires. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds in the things of the flesh, Paul says in Romans 8, 5. It's easy for the fleshly or the carnally minded person who is focused... I mean, let, me, let me rephrase that. It is easy to be a person who is focused on fleshly things. To be a carnally minded person. It is easy to be that kind of person. It is easy to be that kind of Christian if we're not careful. The carnally minded Christian thinks about the things of God sometimes. Sometimes. But those things are not really a priority. Those aren't things that are really very interesting to the carnally minded Christian. It's not the thing that really captures his attention to think about the things of God. You know, there are Christians who are like that. Even though they have been baptized into Christ, even though they may come to worship God regularly or frequently, there are those Christians who really are fleshly minded, carnally minded, who are focused, instead of being focused on the things of God, who are focused on earthly pleasures, entertainment, material things, material wealth. Those are the things that occupy the attention of the one who's carnally minded. And that pushes out the spiritual focus and the focus on the things of God. If you would miss worship on Sunday to go to a party, then you're probably a carnally minded Christian, even though you may worship God most of the rest of the time. The one who chooses the worldly over the spiritual is the kind of person who has his mind set on the things of the flesh, the here and now, the physical, instead of that which is most important. If you're going to be spiritually minded, then that starts with having your mind set on the things of God. 
that the things of God are most important. That that's where the focus needs to be. So that's where we start with the idea of being spiritually minded. But let's move on and notice that the next step in being spiritually minded is to live according to the Spirit. There in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5, as we just read, Paul says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds in the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, live according to the Spirit. The spiritually minded person is one who follows God's instruction in his life. And notice again what Paul says here. There is this idea of living according to the Spirit. The lives of those who are spiritually minded are lived according to what is prescribed by the Spirit of God in the Word. These are the ones who are more than just Christians who own a Bible. A lot of people have Bibles. How many people are actually following what the Bible says to do? These are the ones who are living like Christians are supposed to live. The ones who are living according to the Spirit are the ones who are actively following the teaching of Scripture and how they conduct themselves. The spiritually minded person is one who will worship God in spirit and truth as Jesus directed in John 4 and verse 24. The spiritually minded person, how will he or she interact with others? What did Jesus say in Luke 6, in verse 36? Whatever you want men to do to you, do to them likewise. Right? That principle of treating others the way you want to be treated, that's how the spiritually minded person will interact with other people. Treat them how you want to be treated. The spiritually minded person acts like he really believes what the Bible says, not just when we come together as a church. Anybody can put on a good show and, and appear as though they believe what God says when we're together worshiping. The spiritually minded person, though, acts like he really believes what God says at home, on the job, even in recreation. Wherever we are, the spiritually minded one lives like he believes this is the word of God and is following what God has said at all times. Now again, the contrast. What about those who live according to the flesh? What about the carnally minded person? That's the one who lives according to the desires of the flesh. We all, of course, live in bodies of flesh. We have physical bodies. These bodies are equipped with certain desires, certain needs that have to be fulfilled. And God has provided us with the means to properly fulfill those desires. But you know, there are also plenty of sinful ways to fulfill our fleshly desires. Try to serve the flesh and gratify the flesh. The carnally minded person, the fleshly minded person does whatever feels good at the time. The carnally minded one does whatever will fulfill his fleshly desires at the moment instead of being careful to live how God wants him to live. That's the fleshly approach. That's what it means to live according to the flesh. If it feels good to me at the time, I'm going to do it. If this is what I want to engage in, this is what I feel like doing, that's what I'm going to do. If this is how I feel like talking to this person, that's the way I'm going to talk. If this is how I feel like treating that person, that's the way I'm going to do it. Because that's what feels right to me right now. That's what it means to live according to the flesh. If you're going to be spiritually minded, you're going to have to live your life the way the Bible says to live according to what God has instructed, not just whatever feels right or feels good to you at the time. So as we think about being spiritually minded, it begins with having the focus on the things of God, and then we move from there to living our lives the way that God instructs us to live. Now, also, let's notice that those who are spiritually minded will find life and peace 
in doing God's will. A spiritually minded person has peace with God. Notice as we continue on here in Romans chapter 8, into the next few verses here, verses 6 through 8, Paul writes, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, viewing things from a divine perspective, viewing things the way God does, we see that to be spiritually minded, to be spiritually minded here is life and peace. Life and peace. In other words, to be spiritually minded, that is the approach that will allow you to maintain your fellowship with God. That's the approach that will allow you to have a peaceful relationship with God as one of His children. We go back to Romans chapter 5, just a few chapters before this. Notice what Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 1. He says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when we take advantage of the sacrifice of Christ, when we obey the gospel of Jesus, that's when we have peace with God. Remember, that's when the sins are taken away so that we can have a relationship with God. That's when we enter into that peaceful relationship with the Lord. But we stay on friendly terms with God when we continue to do His will in our lives. You know, for many people, living the good life means what? It means engaging in all the sinful pleasure that you can get involved in, right? The good life, that's where you can go get a, a 24 pack, right? And get together with your friends and maybe go up to the cottage. Now you're living the good life by the world's standards, right? Or you're living the good life when you've really accumulated a lot of money, a lot of material wealth, maybe possessions, maybe you've got a fancy car and a nice house and you've got a lot of money in the bank, and you're living the good life. You can buy whatever you want to buy. Whatever toy you want to have, you can go out and get it. That's, that's the good life by the world standards. That's the culture in which we live. But the spiritually minded person understands that the very best life that he can live is a life of obedient service to the Lord. That is where we find peace. That is where we find contentment. That is where we find fulfillment. Is in living a life that is in harmony with the will of God. Notice again the contrast. What about the carnal minded person? What does Paul say about the carnally minded? He says here in verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. That's the opposite of life and peace. And notice, the carnal mind is enmity against God. What is enmity? Strife. Conflict. And so instead of life and peace, you have death and conflict for the one who's carnally minded. What we have to realize is that the carnal minded approach to life that idea of doing whatever you feel like doing, that is an approach that puts us in the position of being at war against God. Being enemies of God puts us right back in the position of being condemned by God. That's what that approach does to us. You see, even though we're living earthly lives in bodies of flesh, we are still expected to maintain a heavenly focus. We are expected, even in these bodies of flesh, to find our ultimate fulfillment in pleasing God. Now, the carnally minded person, notice, notice what Paul says, those who are in the flesh, those who are focused on the flesh, those who have the carnal minded approach, he says they cannot please God. Can't please God. Why? 
Is it because they're just incapable? Is it because you and I have some ability that this person doesn't have? No. No. This is true for the simple reason that you can't fight against God and rebel against God and at the same time submit to God and do what's pleasing to God. You can't do those two things at the same time. So if we're going to take that fleshly approach, we can't please God while we're doing that. You can't make a living as a bank robber and also be a good citizen, law-abiding citizen at the same time. You can't do that. Those two things are opposite of one another. You can't, you can't be sober and be drinking intoxicating drink at the same time. Those two things are opposed to one another. And so it is that you can't be fleshly minded and please God at the same time. Those two things are opposite of one another. So if you're spiritually minded, that means that you're the type of person who finds life and peace in doing God's will. You're not trying to do whatever feels good at the time. And so as we think about these things, being spiritually minded involves focusing on the things of God, living how God instructs us to live, and then also finding our fulfillment in doing God's will and recognizing this is the very best that I can have. This is the best kind of life that I can live. All right, let's move on then. In order to be spiritually minded as a Christian, you have to put to death the deeds of the body. As we move forward there in Romans chapter 8, skip down with me in the passage that we've read there to verse 13. The spiritually minded person, you see, is the one who controls his own desires. In Romans 8 and verse 13, Paul says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. God doesn't want us to kill ourselves, physically, of course. Instead, He wants us to be living sacrifices to Him. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 tells us that. But He does want us to kill something. He doesn't want us to kill ourselves. But there is something He wants us to put to death. What he does want us to kill are those deeds, those sinful activities, those sinful desires, those things that are known as the works of the flesh. Just turn with me over to Galatians chapter 5 and let's just, let's just notice what those kinds of things are. In Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, begin reading with me there in verse 19. What does it mean? What is Paul talking about when he talks about living according to the flesh or being carnally minded or focusing on the things of the flesh? Well, this is what he means. Notice Galatians 5, picking up in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, <coughs> envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You'll notice in that list that we just read, Paul begins by talking about sexual sin, sexual immorality, fornication, adultery, unauthorized sexual activity. And then he goes on to talk about attitude problems like hatred and, and contention and being jealous and envying others. He also works in their false religious practices like idolatry and sorcery and heresy. And then there's also other ungodly activity like murder, drunkenness, revelries, wild partying drinking of intoxicating beverages, all of those kinds of activities, all of those improper attitudes, all of that is characteristic 
of living according to the flesh, doing what you feel like doing. Well, as we think about that, we need to recognize that it is not enough just to limit our sinful works and desires. That's not the goal here. The goal is not just to manage our sinful desires or sinful activities. The goal is not just to, to keep from doing it too often. The spiritually minded person understands that the only way to live a life pleasing to God is to get rid of those things that God hates. To just remove all of that out of his or her life. That's the spiritually minded approach. Don't just try to limit it. Don't just, don't just keep it to once in a while. Get rid of it completely. The carnally minded person, you see, the fleshly minded person is one who allows his desires to control him. And not only to control him, but eventually to destroy him. And notice again here in Romans 8 and verse 13, that Paul says, for if you live according to the flesh, what? You'll have the time of your life. You'll have everything you could ever dream of. You'll, you'll have a wonderful time and you'll never suffer any bad consequences from it. No. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. You will die. And the dying of which the apostle speaks here is not merely physical death. We can all expect to experience physical death, whether we obey the Lord or not. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 tells us it is appointed to man to die once, but after this the judgment. So we can all expect to experience physical death, no matter what we've done in this world, until the Lord returns. The death that is under discussion here, this dying for the carnally minded person is spiritual death. Being cut off from God. Being condemned by our creator. You see, if we allow our desires to rule us and to drive us and to control us, and we yield to the temptation to fulfill our fleshly desires, maybe with gossip, maybe with pornography, maybe just with laziness, not doing what we should do. Maybe it's intoxicating drink. Maybe it's sexual immorality. If we allow our desires to control us in doing those things and engaging in those things, we will be condemned. Make no mistake about it. You will die, the Bible says. You have to put all those things to death. Those bad attitudes, those sinful desires, those ungodly activities, all of that needs to be put to death, put out of your life in order to be spiritually minded as a child of God. And so we begin with focusing on the things of God and then living according to God's instruction, and then we move on from there to recognizing that our true fulfillment, our best life, our peacefulness is based on our relationship with God, and then we, we continue to rid ourselves of anything that's going to take us away from that. Any evil desire, any evil action is removed from our lives. And then, if you want to be spiritually minded, You've got to allow yourself to be led by the Spirit. And here when we mention the Spirit, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. The spiritually minded person is directed by what the Holy Spirit has revealed. Notice Romans 8 and verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Please understand, as we think about this idea of being led by the Spirit, there is nothing mystical 
There is nothing mysterious, there's nothing magical about this process of being led by the Spirit of God. It is not the idea that at some point God just takes over, the Holy Spirit just takes hold of me and directs me apart from my own will and drives me in certain directions. That's not what's under consideration here. That's not what the Bible teaches. Here's how this works. The Holy Spirit has revealed the will of God to mankind. And the Holy Spirit directed certain men to write down God's instruction so that it could be preserved and passed down and, and known by all. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 3 for one example of where we see this process discussed. Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, begin reading with me there in verse 1. Paul says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. The Holy Spirit revealed God's message from heaven. He revealed it to the apostles and prophets of the Lord. Those men, as Paul indicates here, wrote it down in words. And when we read it, we can understand God's message, God's instruction, God's will for us. The spiritually minded person is led by the Spirit of God in that he is actively following the instruction of God's Word which was revealed by the Holy Spirit. When we do what the Bible says, we are being led and directed by the Spirit of God who gave it. When you're living your life based on the teaching of Scripture, you can be sure that you are living a Spirit-led life. If you're doing what the Bible says for you to do, if you're acting the way the Bible says you need to act, if you're doing the things that the Word of God instructs, you can be sure that you're being led by the Spirit of God in the way that you're living your life. That's the only way that you can know that you're being led by the Spirit of God, is if you're doing what He says to do in His Word. But the carnally minded person, the fleshly minded person, well that individual will probably ignore the Spirit's instruction. The carnally minded person may get a few things right. Maybe he believes in Jesus or says he does. Maybe he's even been baptized into Christ. Maybe he even assembles with the church on a regular basis. And maybe he's a pretty decent person by the world's standards and the way that he lives his life. But here's the problem. The problem with the carnally minded person is that when it really comes down to it, he refuses to be led by the Spirit in the way that he lives his life. He gets a few things right. Why? Because he feels like doing those things. When what God says matches up with what I feel like doing, then I'll do it. What about when what God says doesn't match up with what I feel like doing? What then? You see, the carnally minded individual may get a few things right in his life because he feels like doing those things, not because he's truly submitting to God's authority over his life. You see, when the carnal-minded person has to make a choice over whether to do what the Bible says to do or do what he feels like doing, he's going to do what he feels like doing. 
That's the fleshly approach. That's the carnal-minded approach. If he wants to commit a particular sin, he'll do it. Even if the Bible says not to, he'll go ahead and do it. He may make excuses like, oh, well, it's okay just this time. God will understand. God knows I'm just human. Whatever the case may be, anything to excuse it. That's the fleshly approach. That's the carnal-minded approach. But if you're going to be spiritually minded, you have to allow God's Word to be your guide for everything you do in your life. Everything. Think about what it means to be spiritually minded this morning. We begin by focusing our minds on the things of God. We move from there to living the way that God instructs us to live. And then we find our peace and our life, our fulfillment in doing God's will and serving Him. We put to death the sinful actions and attitudes. We get rid of those things out of our lives. And the way that we live is that we're led by the Spirit. We're truly being directed by what God has said. Remember, there are two kinds of Christians. Two kinds of Christians in this world. There are those who are spiritually minded, and there are those who are carnally minded. The question we want to think about this morning is, which one are we? Which one are you? Which kind am I? Are you truly spiritually mine? Now remember, heaven is for the spiritually minded. The carnally minded, the fleshly minded just end up right back in condemnation. Remember what we read earlier, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Heaven is for the spiritually mind. And so I want all of us to think about that, how important that is this morning as we looked at what the Scripture says. Can we match up in our lives to that description given of the spiritually minded? Is that the way that we're living? Is that the approach that we're taking? There is too much at stake here to do it any other way. We need to have the commitment. We need to have the love for the Lord. We need to have the dedication that it takes to be a spiritually minded individual. One who will be with God for eternity. If you're already a Christian but you recognize that you have not been a spiritually minded child of God, Maybe there's some changes that need to be made for the better. Maybe there's some sin that you've committed or that you're involved in that needs to be stopped, that needs to be corrected. Maybe it needs to be confessed this morning so that you can turn from it and receive forgiveness from God. We'd like to help you and encourage you to do that so that you can leave here as a spiritually minded child of God. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you have to recognize that if you're still in your sins, that means you're still condemned before God. But it doesn't have to stay that way. You can come and confess your belief in Jesus this morning. You can turn from your sins and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. You can start out today being among those who are spiritually minded, those who are headed for heaven. And we would love to help you start that journey this morning if that's your need. If, if you have those spiritual needs, if we can assist you, encourage you, pray for you, and help you to be right with God this morning, won't you please come as we stand at this time and as we sing.